Welcome to this episode of the PA Path Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Lohenry, and we are glad you could join us as we seek to better understand the PA profession. We still are a um, inquiry-based learning curriculum, so we still utilize small groups as the primary delivery of all of our curriculum. Well, hello, and thank you for joining us again. Today, we speak with Mr. Brian Peacock, who is the program director at the Wake Forest School of Medicine Physician Assistant Program. Brian and I talk about his path to becoming a PA, his time as a clinical preceptor, and about his program's unique inquiry-based curriculum. Brian shares some great tips for applicants related to their personal statements and for students related to preparing for the stress of PA training. As always, you can learn more about our guest, and about the Wake Forest Physician Assistant Program on our website at papathpodcast.com under the blog section for show notes. Well, Brian, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a a pleasure to get to know you and Wake Forest. It's uh, such a prestigious program. I I noticed that you just celebrated your 50th year a couple years ago, and so you've certainly had a long track record as a program, but have always been known to be doing innovative things. Uh, Before we get into the program, I thought we'd start talking a little bit about you and your path to becoming a PA. So if you don't mind sharing kind of how you ended up in the profession and where you ended up practicing clinically and then moving into academe, that would be great. Sure. And thank you um, for having me on your podcast. I really appreciate all you're doing for our profession and our our future PAs, um, and hopefully future PA leaders. So my path is a little bit different. Um, I grew up in a small mountain town in Western North Carolina in a family where uh, my mom was a florist and a wedding planner. My father was a professor in the School of Business, um, and none of them had any interest in the sciences at all. Um, So I was kind of the oddball in the family. I was always interested in in science, always interested um, actually in animals. So early on in about middle school, I started volunteering at the local veterinary office. Um, I spent my afternoons after school um, cleaning cages, walking the animals, watching them perform physical exams, and just was fascinated with the whole process. But I always felt like there was a little part of being a vet that was missing for me. I eventually realized it was the communication. It was just the, the connection you can make with, with the patients and the people. Um, but I went to undergrad at NC State, um, graduated in a, a biology degree, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Still love science, um, still had this kind of itch for medicine became a phlebotomist and an autopsy assistant um, at a local hospital and uh, really loved it. Just loved all the aspects of it. The phlebotomy part really allowed me to connect with patients um, in the emergency room, outpatient setting, um, inpatient doing rounds, and really drove my passion for just talking to patients. And then being in the, in the morgue doing the autopsies um, was just fascinating to me. Just seeing the anatomy and walking through that process, I just absolutely loved my job and thought I can actually do this combo of jobs for the rest of my life. I was extremely happy. After a few years, I started to realize that working in the morgue was taking a toll on me emotionally. Kind of felt this disconnect with my emotions and reality and lost some sympathy um, and some empathy that uh, I think is true to myself and started wondering if there was something else I could do. One of my teammates at the time who was a phlebotomist had left the team to go to what was PA school. And being from a small town in Western North Carolina, I'd never heard of the PA profession or seen a PA before. So we had talked about it for a while. And then um, she went off to school. I continued working in the morgue and as a phlebotomist. And then when I started thinking, maybe I should look into a different career. Maybe I'm, I'm missing something um, and I need to get out uh, and spend more time with patients face to face. Started researching the PA profession and saw different programs, had different styles of teaching was interested in learning more. I saw Wake Forest at the time was using an an IBL or PBL process as their primary driver of curriculum delivery. It was intrigued. I'd never learned from that model um, in small groups, case-based learning. So actually just called the school and talked to Janie McDaniel. She said, come on down. And so um, Janie gave me a tour of of the school, talked to me about what the PA profession was. And I met some of the faculty and they gave me some good insight. And I got to sit in on actually some IBL groups and just walked away at the end of the day thinking, this is it. This is what I want to do. This is where I want to be. And I want to be a Wake Forest PA. And so um, I did the one thing which I would tell applicants not to do, which is I only applied to one school, which was Wake Forest, and was lucky enough to get in. And I haven't looked back since. It's been one of the best decisions I've ever made. 
And so following graduation from Wake Forest, you ended up in surgery, as I understand. Uh, I did. Um, uh, I guess the anatomy still drove the whole kind of drive for cutting and sewing and procedure-based things. And um, on one of my rotations, I actually was um, here at, at the primary academic hospital. In surgery, my primary preceptor was a colorectal surgeon. And at the time, he was the only colorectal surgeon for the entire institution. Um, and they had no APPs um, on the staff. And so as a student rotating through, um, we were extremely busy. I was pre-rounding at 4.30 in the morning. And then he was operating until 7 or 8 at night. We'd round and go home. And it was just fall on the bed, wake up, come back in the next morning as early as I could. And by the end, we developed a really good relationship. And I started just kind of asking, could I help you? Could I help you with these hours? Could I take care of some of the people in the clinic um, and around the floor to keep you from having to do all this? And thought it was a good idea. And so they hired me on the team. And that service now has three surgeons and three APPs. That's fantastic. So, so you planted a seed. You saw a need in his day-to-day grind. You planted a seed and it resulted not only in your hiring, but ultimately three APPs. That's, that's fantastic. And I still work with him one day a week uh, in the clinic. Yeah, we had a great relationship and just um, uh, trust each other and have a, have, have a good bond. So how, how did he take it when you decided you wanted to move into education? He supported me. He's always supported in, in everything that I wanted to do. So I, I give all the credit to him. I was started precepting after about a year of clinical practice and taking students, which really ignited my passion for teaching. Again, my father was a professor, and uh, I think it just kind of picked up from there. I, I, I caught this bug to teach and loved precepting. It allows you to push students um, outside their comfort zone. Um, they come in with this wealth of knowledge and they're trying to figure out how do I put it all together? I have the puzzle pieces, but what does the big picture look like? And you can really watch them mold their style and how they're going to practice medicine. And you really got to impact the way that they started working with their own kind of clinical styles, if you will. And I had always heard, you know, after graduation, the first six months of independent clinical practice was going to be the most difficult time you have, Um, just all the things to learn. And I found it to be true, but the thing that I wasn't really expecting was it wasn't the medicine. It wasn't the, the clinical reasoning process or the treating of a disease that was so difficult. It was treating of the patient that was so difficult. It was all of a sudden you have to figure out who is social work? What does social work do? What if they can't afford the medicine? What if they can't get transportation to come back to get a wound check? What if, you know, you're supposed to have your staples up and they can't get here? Navigating just the nuances of of clinical practice and taking care of people took up the majority of the time. And so I started imparting that on the students as they were coming through on rotations and being like, outside of the medicine, what should we be talking about? And really took the focus of, I had some preceptors in school when I went in, when I was going through that, if they were going to go have a really difficult conversation or they knew it was going to be a really challenging procedure because it was a child or someone who wasn't able to control themselves or understand fully what was going on, they would say, you don't want to be kind of a part of this. I was the opposite as a preceptor. And I said, you need to hear this tough conversation. And I'm not an expert on this. I'm still figuring out how to have these conversations. We work in a cancer center one day a week. And so we were having difficult conversations about life, life expectancy with family and friends, um, about poor outcomes, about wounds. And um, I said, come be part of this, watch, listen, we'll debrief it afterwards. And what did you learn? What can I do better um, as part of the process to hopefully impart that on them as they get into practice, Um, which eventually led to me, you know, I was precepting 10, 11, 12 students a year. And I started wondering, what if I could have this impact on more? What if I could teach or be part of the process of training 100 students a year? And so it got me interested in maybe I should look into teaching more and more. And so a job opened up at uh, at Wake Forest PA program. And uh, Reamer Bouchard was the chair of the department at that time. And Zach Hartzell was the program director. So I reached out to them. They encouraged me to apply. And um, I started off in, on the clinical year team, um, actually with preset for site development and training. And through time, just kind of became part of the entire program and eventually program director. So Brian, as a preceptor, you're a year out, you're working in general surgery, and you make the decision to start precepting students. Tell me about that decision and and how that experience was. Because in my in my experience, so many PAs are reticent to train PA students just a year out. They they have this mindset that they need five years under their belt before they become a preceptor. 
you know, once you graduate, you're, you're really armed with the tools you need to go take care of patients. And some of the difficulties can be in just that confidence and growing and becoming efficient. I think the students benefit from seeing you grow and develop. And I think one of the core values of being a PA or one of the big parts is being able to say, I don't know. And you can't be afraid if a student asks you a question to say, I don't know, um, but let's look it up. Encourage them to look it up and teach you about it. They'll love that. Have them do presentations, have them participate in grand rounds. Um, they're going to ask questions that you won't know the answer to, whether it's your first year out or whether it's, it's your 10 year anniversary. Um, there's going to be times where they prompt stuff you think, I don't remember that. It's a great question. But it doesn't mean they can't look it up and t- teach you about it. And then go refresh yourself. And so it's lifelong learning. You're entering a field that's lifelong learning. Being able to say, I don't know, is one of the strongest qualities a PA can have. My supervising physician for many years, uh, Dr. Scott Kobaba, had this great saying that I'll never forget. And it was that medicine is a continually humbling business. And when you have that, that sense of humility every day, then you're right. It doesn't matter if you don't know the answer because it's, there's too much to know. So I appreciate that. I think we, as program directors, really struggle with clinical training sites. And at least data from maybe five years ago suggests that only about 25% of our colleagues actually train PAs. So we, we certainly could uh, make a dent in that if more PAs were willing to step up. Yeah, and I encourage all um, graduates to teach, whether it's from your school or a different school, you'll actually find that it's, it's enjoyable, it's fun, it pushes you. There's a, a global concern about does it slow you down? Does it impact what you do? I always found that it energized me um, and made me really want to um, push myself and push them and uh, it made me a better PA. So what was the intrigue to the leadership role? It just kind of happened. As I started off with the, with the preceptor development and then got into more teaching in the classroom, giving lectures, um, I became a course director for our clinical year prep block, which is a, a series of four weeks where we teach a lot of hands-on procedure-based training. And then I became the clinical year director and just kind of started navigating the team um, and talking about different courses and how we wanted to, to roll out preceptors and what to do with different situations, different learning environments, and just enjoyed watching kind of a shared leadership role and working with everyone on the team. And then we have a campus in Boone, also a campus in Winston. So I became the associate program director for the Winston campus to kind of help navigate and kind of share leadership with the the entire Winston campus first year and second year. And just, uh, I've really enjoyed every minute I've had. And you talked about in terms of leadership and mentorship, the, the program has always had such a rich history of leaders. Reamer, Zach, uh, Janie, you have Robert Wooten, Sue Reich, Gail Curtis. Tell me why, why Wake has always had such a great path for leadership development. Leadership is one of the core um, values we have for our students. We started up a ELP program, uh, which is a dual degree, it's a sequential degree program for our students. If they are interested in being here for three years, we have one with the School of Law at Wake Forest and one with the School of Business. And they come in and spend the first year either getting a Master's of Science in Management um, or Master's of Study in Law, and then roll right into the PA program. And the the, the schools have been very um, generous and helpful in meeting our timelines and our goals. And we really try and provide them with the tools that they need to graduate and not just take care of patients, but to impact the healthcare system as a whole. We want our graduates to become leaders in the hospital, in the clinics, in their communities, in their states. Whatever we can do to have them improve the PA profession and patient outcomes has been a a goal of ours for 50 years. So essentially, when your students start after that first year in law or in business, when they come into the classroom, they're contributing a totally different perspective, I would imagine, to the regular curriculum that most students experience. They do. And we use the, we still are a um, inquiry-based learning curriculum. So we still utilize small groups as the primary delivery of all of our curriculum. And so they're put into groups of eight students with one faculty facilitator for eight to 12 weeks, depending on which unit we are in. And they work through cases. And having those students who have done the extra year really drive some of the bigger questions. How are we going to pay for that? You know, how, how's that funded? And when the prompts come up to discuss things like Medicare, Medicaid, um, when things come up about um, legal rights, things come up about um, uh, consent and those sorts of things, they really drive those conversations. And so 
it's allowed us as the faculty to step back and make sure the conversations are happening, but the students are now driving some of those deeper, really patient-based questions versus just the soul, how do we diagnose that disease? How do we treat that disease? So a fair amount of uh, PA schools use a small group format, case-based format in part of their curriculum. But your school is one of the few in the country that actually uses it as, uh, as I understand, a main driver of your curriculum. So would you help us understand exactly how that looks like day to day and throughout the course of your entire curriculum? Yes. And so they come in, uh, they start PA school in the summer. It's 24 consecutive months. Um, And then they graduate. And that first four-week block is a hit-the-ground running anatomy and physiology kind of leveling the playing field. So everybody is required to have anatomy and physiology as a prerequisite, but their timelines are all different. We encourage lots of clinical hours and experience to get into PA school here at Wake. And so sometimes it's been many years since they've actually been in the lab. And so it's it's a four-week really intensive experience in the cadaver lab at the School of Medicine working through anatomy and physiology. And then as soon as that four-week is over, they start the IBL process. They get an intro to a case on Monday, and they'll work in their groups of eight um, with a faculty facilitator to get a part of the case, which is usually just a vague chief complaint. We start them right out of the gate with um, mechanistic hypothesis. So what kind of physiology or what kind of pathologic process could be going on to cause the symptom? And they develop these large mind maps. And uh, as you can imagine, the very beginning, it's difficult. Um, and they don't fully understand, but we focus on big concepts. And then as the year progresses, more and more details. And they work through the case throughout the week. And um, they're given some prompts. They're given some info. And as they request stuff, if they can justify why they need it, they're provided the information. And the facilitator helps guide to keep them on the track up for the objectives of the week. And then by the time Friday rolls around, they've really completed the case. They work on the final assessment plan and kind of follow up from there. Throughout the week, they get supplemental lectures and some few labs, such as uh, physical exam labs. Uh, we have a full functioning, clearly approved lab here. And so they do blood draws, run blood tests, and it's part of the cases it's built into. So they're actually applying the stuff they're doing throughout the week as they go. And then we have some final wrap-up lectures on Friday afternoons to kind of pull the case together, ensure everybody's on the same page, answer questions as one big cohort across both campuses, and then... Um, was on Monday morning to make sure they got it and on to the next case. Wow. Wow. So that's really, you're driving right through. So, so for a module like EENT, it might be a, a one or two weeks, whereas cardiology might be there over the course of a month or a month and a half. It's broken up into four units in that first year. And so um, over an eight week period, they'll cover the first eight week period, they'll cover hematology, they'll cover dermatology, and they'll cover endocrine. And they're all interwoven together in the cases, starting off kind of basic um, and then more and more complex as it goes along. Then we have a 12-week block for GI, cardiology, and pulmonology. So, so you might start out with a simple anemia case in the beginning, and then down the road, you might have petechiae related to you know, some dermatologic finding related to some underlying pathophysiologic process. Exactly. That's really, really interesting. I'm just curious for the students, what are probably the key learnings that you've experienced over the years in terms of just them kind of putting it all together and how that kind of light goes off in their brain? Initially, it's difficult. Uh, And they come in, they love the idea of I don't have to sit in the classroom all the time. And we still have lectures, but it's the idea of I have time in group. I have time then to go research and come back to the group with the questions that we came up with. And they like the idea. Um, But when they come and sit down for the first few weeks, it's fun. It's different. It's that honeymoon phase. And we tell everybody you will crash and the honeymoon phase will end. Typically, um, education system in the U.S. is primarily lecture learner based and um, uh, tested on very specific things. They know what they're going to be tested on. And they memorize. And we talk about this. You know, historically, you go in, you're told next week you have a quiz on chapter three. And they go home and they highlight and they flashcard. They memorize chapter three. They come in. They're regurgitated on the test. And then they say, next week is chapter five. And they go home and they just forget all of chapter three, skip through chapter four, go to chapter five. And we kind of give them more freedom to be creative and think. And it can be frustrating at times to say, you know, they, will, they will come out and just say, just tell me what I need to know. Um, we say, you just got to trust the process. You, you will learn it all. You just got to keep, keep pushing along. And they work together really well and have very diverse backgrounds. And so if their background's in dermatology, they help drive a lot of the conversations around rashes and management. Um, but in hematology, they may not know anything. And so other members can help with that. 
in the end, it's, it's just fascinating to see how well they develop the clinical reasoning process, which is our whole goal, is that we can't teach you everything. And if we taught you everything, within a few years, most of it would be out of date. And so we want to teach you to identify resources um, that are up to date, maintain that you know how to find, you know how to clinically uh, read through, and then apply to your patients. Uh, and so it's about providing them different resources, allowing them to utilize those resources, come back, teach the rest of the group, talk through problems, um, and become just fascinating problem solvers with a good understanding versus memorizing uh, medicine. It's a really interesting curriculum. So I have, a, I have to imagine that there is some impact on the way faculty typically in, integrate into the curriculum, where they're teaching, how they're facilitating. What does that typical work week look like for your full-time faculty? We have lots of meetings. I think all faculty have lots of meetings. I think that's just part of the job. Um, but not our favorite part. <laughs> not our favorite part. Um, but there are uh, Monday morning meetings, first thing out of the gate for all the facilitators, and they go through the case together. We have very specific objectives and bullet points that they must meet as far as our um, objectives for the week that fit into our larger outcomes. And then they just help drive the conversations. And if they find them going down a rabbit hole, they can either say, make that a learning issue to look up and come back. I'm going to talk to us about, or maybe we've gotten a little too far into this. Let's, let's table that and, and get back to the case. Cause sometimes they'll find themselves kind of wandering down a path that's in the wrong direction. We just kind of help guide them along the week. And so the, the facilitators are in all the small groups with the students, uh, which are Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then the labs to help them as well. So there was a lot of interaction with the students, which generates a very team-based atmosphere. That's another one of the challenges the students can have is most of our, our students we find are very, you know, want to be grade driven, like their entire life. It's, it's, I have to be the best. I have to achieve this to get to this. And we really try and demystify that and break it down early and say, um, you may not even know what your grades are for a little while. We really want you guys to work together. You have to learn to work together. This profession is team-based. Um, you're going to work in teams. And if you can't work together here, we don't think you can work together well out there. And so we push them to share resources, work together, have difficult conversations, uncomfortable conversations, work through problems together, and then just let them know you have advisors who are watching everything you do as far as your assessments, and we will let you know if we have any concerns. And in the beginning, it's difficult because they're so used to getting that immediate feedback and knowing what did I miss, what I need to work on. But we drive it to continue to work together, continue. We will talk to you about it. So they can struggle with that in the beginning, um, but typically they just adapt, learn to like it. And by the end, they, they, they see the big picture. So in your admissions process, you, you talked about the diversity of the perspectives in the small groups. In your admissions process, are you looking for that diversity in a mindful way to eventually place into those small groups? Or is it kind of happenstance? And once you see the diversity after you've accepted a class, then you start to think about how to spread out those experiences? The groups are actually at randomly selected. And so we don't control for who goes into which group um, each unit. But our admissions process is very much on interview day. Can we get to know the person? Um, they've met the criteria to get an interview. And so at that point, it's how well do they function in teams? How well can we get to know you as a person versus did you answer that prompt correctly? But more about who you are, what you have learned from your experiences, being able to say, yeah, I was in this situation. I probably made the wrong decision. Reflecting on it, this is how. And so really trying to show that personal growth and getting to know each applicant for who they are and can they work together as a team more so than what have they accomplished or what can they do? Not to give away any secrets, but how do you, how do you assess that as a program on one admissions day to see if they are suitable for team-based learning? We put them through a few team exercises. Um, we actually run them through a small group case um, and help drive that discussion and see how they interact with each other more so than being right about what questions you would ask or what anatomy or what physiology. Um, but how well do they function together as a team? And then we do a series of, of group interviews where we have multiple faculty sitting in um, with several applicants and ask them more behavioral type questions um, and see how they respond. And that method has proved well for us for a little while. Brian, given your unique curriculum, what's the best advice you can give applicants who are exploring your program and trying to determine if it's a good fit for them? I would encourage all applicants to look at the program's websites, um, attend any virtual open house they may have, and really try and figure out if the mission and vision of that program matches their personal mission and vision. 
if you try and go somewhere that doesn't align with who you are, um, you may be successful academically, but you want to enjoy your time there. PA school is hard enough as it is, no matter where you go. Um, it's a lot to learn in a short amount of time. And you need to make sure the environment is going to be suitable to your learning style for where you are in your life uh, to make sure that you're successful and enjoy it as much as you can. I would encourage applicants, uh, once you figure out which schools match your, your mission and, and vision, to spend as much time as you can on your supplemental application as you do on your personal statement. We are finding that we get these really robust, rich personal statements that come through and then they get to the supplemental for our program. Those supplementals have specific prompts for those programs or schools. And there's two, three sentences for each prompt versus the rich, robust. And so put the energy and effort into that supplemental. That's really what the programs are going to look at to try and set you apart from the other um, applicants. I would encourage applicants to focus a little bit less on the number of experiences they have and more on how those experiences tell their story. How did it impact them and who they are? So we get a lot of applicants who say um, uh, for community service or for volunteering, we organized and put on you know, a 24 hour dance a thon, which is a great thing. You can raise a lot of money um, for a lot of good charities or organizations. But the follow up is did that charity or organization have an impact on you? So after the dance a thon, did you go volunteer there? Did you go reach out to provide more help besides just financial? Did you get engaged with what their missions are? If you went on a mission trip, I'm sure it was unbelievably impactful to who you were, but explain that impact and say, did you bring any of those characteristics back to you? Did you work in your local communities you know, within the US? Did you go back um, on another mission trip? Less about the number of things you did, you did and more about how it impacted you and what you did afterwards. Um, it's something we're really looking for. It's that long-term commitment to serving others. So it sounds like you probably experienced something that we experienced, which is there are the applicants who create a checklist and say community service check, but they lack a depth to that story. And, and what you're looking for is really folks that were impacted by it to the point where they actually changed their lives. They started to really dedicate their lives to others in, in a deeper, meaningful way. Exactly. Yeah, we have the same issue. It's it's not a checklist manifesto, right? We're not looking for a a checklist of a yes, uh, they got this, they got that, they have this, they have that. We're looking for somebody who culturally, sociologically has a fit to our culture as a profession. Exactly. And and you know, going through and saying I volunteered at the 13 organizations is great. I'm glad you're able to help out, but I'd almost rather you see you know, spending those 13 days at one place because it met you with where you are and, and what you really want to change in your communities. Yeah, I, that's been a common theme over the podcast so far. I think a lot of program directors have said the same thing. So it's good to know we're all on the same page with that. <laughs> Let's talk about your toughest challenges that your PA students face. You alluded to some of them. I think there's an adjustment phase given the historical educational system in the U.S., what are some of the other things you experience as a program director, obviously without breaking FERPA, maybe more general issues that you see that you can help students that might be listening to your story? I would say coping with stress. I think that um, school is hard and high school is hard, undergraduate's hard, and you get to graduate level medical education and it's extremely difficult. Um, and there's a lot to manage and deal with. So I try and encourage all of our applicants um, who I get to talk to that if they haven't figured out how they need to manage and deal with stress or really stressful situations before PA school, spend that time figuring it out. If it's reading a book, if it's running, if it's yoga, if it's taking a nap, whatever it may be, because when it gets extremely stressful or you feel like there's just too much to do in a week, you need to know what your outlet is and not be trying to figure it out in the moment. I think the, the world communities have enough external stress currently. And then once they're in school and we start pushing to, to learn more, learn faster, apply it, you can see students struggle um, and struggle with it. Um, we also uncover several um, learning disabilities that students may have. They've been able to cope with and manage throughout their entire lives with whatever mechanisms they have. But once you put this volume and this intensity of material on them, they're just not able to cope with it. Uh, we created an Office of Academic Excellence 
which is joint with the School of Medicine and the undergraduate campus, uh, really helps students identify those. We give them the resources they need. We've started putting a larger emphasis on a eventual graduation rate versus an on-time graduation rate. I found that it's more important to identify someone who has a need, give them the time and space to work through that, and then come back and be successful than to try and push them through and have them not be successful. And so ultimately, my goal um, here at Wake is that once you get accepted is I want you to graduate and pass the pants. And I'll do anything I can to help you achieve that. And if that means taking a little break, then we'll work with you to take a little break. Um, if that means finding you some additional resources, we'll find you those resources. But um, if you've worked hard enough to get here, um, I want to make sure we get you through um, and start helping take care of patients. So I imagine that's resulted in a very low attrition rate. Uh, it has. Uh, it has. And so we have uh, a few students every year who elect to, to decelerate to the next class. Um, but I encourage that. I, I say, you know, if, if you're on this teetering brink because of maybe it's, it's, it's the material, maybe it's the studying, maybe it's external, maybe it's a family relationship, maybe it's a community issue, maybe it's um, a big social issue. We have the space to help you with this and we have the resources available to help you with this. And I want to make sure that you get through PA school um, and pass the pants and not just barely make it through. Um, or don't. Brian, that's a really refreshing outlook on things. I think it, it's been my experience that in PA education, sometimes it's uh, succeed or sink, you know, kind of, you're just not cut out for our profession. If you, if you have, can't manage some major life situation. And I find that to be really kind of crazy, right? I, I, I think we're not, uh, we're not going into combat. We're, we're going to take care of people with compassion and be in a patient-centered environment, a patient-centric environment. So how do you kind of navigate that with your team? Uh, because surely the complexity of, of uh, the chaos of a student being in a different phase as they come back is not always ideal to your buttoned-up approach. So you obviously have to have flexibility. Um, we do. And um, we actually have to have some meetings with the students who, who return the next year um, about the cases, because sometimes the cases are very similar or they go in a similar order. And we have to sit down with them and talk to them about, remember, this is a team-based approach. You can actually take on the facilitator role, be the leader of the group and ask the questions. You provide the prompts and help guide their learning process um, and not be the one giving out the answers. <laughs> and the facilitators are kind of aware and know that if there's a student who tends to be providing more answers or kind of driving the group, then we can meet with them afterwards and talk to them about the process. And true leadership doesn't mean that um, you grab the sword of the hill. Um, it means you can help motivate the others and get them um, in the right place too. And so it's about coaching them through the process of being a leader. Yeah. Well, we've talked about leadership a few times. So let's, let's talk a, lot, a little bit more about it because you have two former presidents for the American Academy of Physician Assistants that have been with your school, uh, Gail Curtis, who uh, just recently was president a couple of years ago. And uh, you, you mentioned before we got on that she just retired, which is she had given to the profession for so many years. So we wish Gail the very best. And Robert Wooten, who's still with you, who was president of AAPA when I was president of PAEA. He was the first African-American president for our for any of our national organizations, as I recall. So you have a, a deep tradition of leadership. You have a deep understanding of the American Academy of PAs and kind of where the PA profession's moving towards. So could you talk a little bit about how Wake Forest is gearing up for the changes that seem to be coming in our profession? One of the, one of the, the bigger goals that that I have for not only our profession, but for the healthcare system in general is there's been a lot of things published on burnout and kind of pushing providers to the max. And I found that there's a lot of energy and effort, and it seems like money going into institutions, figuring out how can they make their providers more efficient? How can we make them see more patients um, and take care of more people every day? And um, I have a different view than that. And I'm hoping that I can kind of push my students to go out there um, and, and make a voice is uh, we have a long history in our country um, that has pushed some medical mistrust amongst, amongst the communities um, that we live in. And I can't tell you how many times I continue to hear from big, large medical institutions throughout the country say um, our reputation allows for international people to fly in to come see us. Um, they trust us. They know about us over the, over the sea. Um, 
But my follow-up question is typically, how much trust does the community that your medical facility is in have on you? And how much does that say about reputation versus what you're actually doing in the communities itself? I really want to generate this frame shift um, from how we can make our providers more efficient to how can our providers make a positive impact in our communities? And um, I don't have a, a great answer for this. This is why I'm encouraging our students to do the, the law degree and the business degree to help with some of the legal implications and the financial things. But instead of putting money into having me see two or three more patients a day and getting burned out and then transitioning and then the retraining that goes into that, um, is there a way to actually just hire additional providers, cut back the patient load, and then provide expectations as part of your effort, as part of your energy is actually engaging in the community? So maybe that's a day a week, maybe it's a half day a week, but that's part of your responsibility. Um, those organizations can be healthcare based. So local, local community care centers, mobile health clinics, providing medical health education. Um, it could be reaching out to uh, future students who could be interested in science. So volunteering at high schools, tutoring, reading, promoting science, middle schools, elementary schools. These kids need mentors. Um, I think that if you have your healthcare professionals going to them when they're healthy, versus only coming to you when you're sick um, could really help change some of that trust and relationship. And even outside of that, uh, Winston-Salem is right on the edge of a really large food desert. And so um, engaging with those organizations that help with the food deserts, understanding what they are um, and giving back. And I think the more that our clinicians and our providers can actually engage the community who's in need more than when they're just sick, the better the relationship and trust will be. And I think the overall health comes will improve health come, health care outcomes will improve and you'll see relationships not only across the ocean, um, but their local communities being supportive and promoting. I, I'm totally dating myself when I say this, but and uh, and probably 95 percent of our listeners won't even know this. But Lucille Ball, there, there's this classic episode of Lucille Ball working at a chocolate factory where she is on a conveyor belt and, you know, she's supposed to put the chocolate in a box or whatever it is. And, and the conveyor belt speeds up and she just can't keep up. So she starts eating the chocolate, burying it in her dress, you know, things like that. I think healthcare has become that where to exactly to your point, we just sit and wait for people to come to us. And then we're armed with a prescription pad and diagnostic studies or a scalpel and we fit, we fix it. And then, you know, we give them another prescription and we wait for them to come back because now they're having polypharmacy issues that we don't seem to think through. And, and what you're really talking about is it sounds to me like a real public health focus, a, a public health community based concept of wellness that might limit the resources coming to us because we're actually doing something about extending life and improving the quality of life on the other end. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's brilliant. But you're right. It's a complex thing, right? Because there's a lot of people with their hands in the pot that are paid and their, their, their salary is based on our current model of healthcare, which many would say is flawed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is flawed. And there are people who will say, you know, well, I think that our system is, is broken. And I think in a lot of ways, um, um, it's almost shattered. I think we provide great health care. I think that PAs make a huge positive impact in the healthcare community and treat patients better than any other profession out there. I truly believe that. But I think that if we don't start improving the overall health of our patients in the communities we live in, uh, it continues to spiral in that we need to see more and more people, more and more people, and we don't have enough resources to do that. So Brian, the concept of the ELP that you have, the Emerging Leaders Program, you have them doing that extra year on the front end, and they, they get a dual degree after three years um, with the PA okay. degree. I would, I would expect, given your curriculum, it's tough to throw in extra content around public health in the two years that you have them, other than, is it part of your typical case each week where there's a public health component? Every week we have um, social drivers of health, public health embedded into the case itself. There's always something um, that's embedded into the case from to discuss. And then we have recently... Um, within the last year, started actually blocking off portions of days for community outreach. And so um, the faculty have a little task force together, and we organize events at our um, local uh, food desert um, company called Hope, helping other people eat. 
Um, it's a phenomenal organization. It's almost, um, in simplicity terms, almost like an ice cream truck that takes fresh fruits and vegetables to kids. Wow. Um, and they go down, they play the music, and the kids run up, and they have little <laughs> bags of fruits, vegetables, and homemade bread from the local farms. Um, brilliant. Volunteering there, the community care center, um, even if it's stocking and cleaning and not taking care of people, but just being part of the process. We're now trying to work on developing a path for our uh, the recent um, our alliances with the Afghani people who are being relocated. Actually, we have a, an area around us where they're being relocated, and we're trying to get engaged and, and help them acclimate to the community, whether it's just taking them to schools, whether it's just getting them acclimated with a provider, um, talking about what we do here. And so we're trying to get our students in, in chunks of time blocked off to say, this is your time to make a difference. Um, and get connected with the community in hopes that they'll want to stay in the community, stay engaged with the organizations, and make a positive impact on all those around them. That is amazing. That is really great uh, to hear. So, uh, Brian, is there anything else that you're hoping to talk about that we haven't had a chance to discuss today? I just hope that um, uh, the PA profession continues to grow. Uh, the popularity is there. Um, we have lots of schools out there. Um, I hope that, that the interest is still there to, to help take care of patients. I hope people who have concerns about applying because they have a, a low GPA or a low GRE, don't worry about that. It's more than that. It's more than numbers. Um, the profession is about working in a team to better the healthcare for all. And um, don't be afraid to apply just because you had um, a bad grade or bad score or bad course. Everybody makes mistakes. But put it out there, put it up front. If we're reviewing and we see, hey, you had a semester where things didn't go the way you probably want them to go, um, own it. Describe what happened, how you grew from that experience, um, what's happened since that time. And so the admissions process is uh, a daunting one. It can be expensive. I also encourage you to ask the schools about waivers. Um, some places have ways to uh, waive the fee to ensure we want everybody who is interested in being a PA to be able to apply to be a PA. Very good. Well, Brian, thank you so much. This has been a real pleasure learning about the program and hearing your vision for the future. And I look forward to watching your school continue to shine. And thank you for, um, for putting this together. I think you're making a positive impact on the profession and I appreciate it. And thank you for inviting me. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. We want to thank Brian for taking time to educate us about the unique curriculum at the Wake Forest School of Medicine PA program and for those great tips for applicants students, and for the general public about burnout as well. I have always been impressed by the commitment of their institution to supporting PA leaders as they represent our profession in a wide variety of roles, and now we know why, given the emphasis they have in their culture. Tune in next week as we speak with Dr. Jackie Barnett, the Program Director for the Duke University School of Medicine Physician Assistant Program. We speak with Dr. Barnett about the history of our profession with its start at her institution, the current approach her program is taking to educating students and her lifelong focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion for the world and for our profession. Until next time, we wish you success with whatever path you are walking in life, and thank you for joining us. The purpose of this podcast is to provide news and information on the PA profession and is for informational purposes only. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the speakers and guests and do not necessarily reflect the official position or policy of the University of Southern California.